There's probably never been a more appropriate time to stand and sing a song than that one. To get your blood flowing again after eating. People were concerned. What are we going to do? We're going to fall asleep after we've eaten. Well, we can talk about meditation if we need to. That would help. But what we're going to do instead, Lena Black was talking about it, and I said, oh, we'll be okay because we're going to talk about kissing. Yep, that woke Nathan up right there. Sure did. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. And that will keep you awake for a little while anyway. Make some of them sick. But 2 Corinthians 13. It occurred to me also concerning what we're doing. I think there's a really good practice and idea that we should have as a matter of habit for our lives with respect to spiritual things. We don't ever want to do less, do we? We don't ever want to do less. We want to do more. Or certainly not less. So having this opportunity to study, even though no requirement to do so, means that we're not doing less than we would normally do. And I'm glad that you're here. And I'm glad you've taken the time to uh, be a part of these events. There's nothing like the close connections of those fel that fellowship time to grow as Christians and as a church, as a congregation. And so I'm glad that we have this time for us to study for a few minutes today. And I want us to look at this passage. Now, I will tell you that for the purposes of this lesson, it applies today to every single person except Brian Hall. <laughs> because none of us need to be kissing on him, and he don't need to be kissing on us. Because he still can't shake whatever he's got. So he said, in case when this is over, if he doesn't kiss on you, that's the reason. So whatever we talk about, it doesn't apply to Brian today. Now, this is a great passage. I, I broke it on the college students the other night to get their reaction to it. And they sort of helped plan it, if you will. So look at the text together. I want you to notice, I don't think this text... I say this a lot, but I, I find myself, when I remember it, uh, I, I find that the text comes even more alive. If we constantly remind ourselves that God wrote intentionally, intentionally, not by chance or happenstance or just rolling dice and writing something, there was an intention to it. There's an intentionality to this passage that the translation I use, the New King James, really doesn't bring out very well. But in the original language, it brings it out very well. Let me read it with that original language in mind. Uh, the second part of verse 11. Um, he begins, Finally, brethren, farewell. And then he says, Be perfected. Be comforted. Be single-minded. Be peaceful. That's how the, the language is written. It's written in the form of a command. Be this. And after saying, be this way, he says two things. One, and the God of love and peace will be with you. You be this and God will be with you. And number two, then he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Let's think about this concept together. First of all, he says, I want you to be perfected. Be perfected. The word complete is a very good uh, translation of that word. Be complete. Uh, instead of become complete, the literal translation is be complete. It's a way of saying this is the place you need to get to. 
Now, if we think about it in the matter of perfection, that is, without fault or sinless, doesn't work. It's not going to happen. Except spiritually through Jesus, we are perfected in Him. So literally, God is saying, be perfected. How do you do that? You be in Christ. In Jesus Christ, we find our perfection. That's what the Colossian letter says. So he's telling us we complete who we are when we are in Christ. Without Christ, we are not who we need to be or not all that we need to be. Be perfected. Be comforted. If a person truly is in Christ and finds his or her perfection in Jesus, shouldn't that give you comfort? So, to be com- if you're looking for comfort, we all do from time to time. We look for comfort. In, in so many different ways, we want to be comfortable. I just saw Mike, and he said, I thought I was finished with these sweaters. Well, because the weather changed, and I want to be comfortable. In the middle of our dinner, the ladies were sitting under a vent and said, Can you please turn this air off? Because it wasn't comfortable. We want to be comfortable. We make our lives such that we can be comforted. Spiritually speaking, there's no way to be comfortable outside of Jesus Christ. Because that's where our perfection comes from. So when you are in Christ, you will be comforted. Be single-minded. Now he says, and I think he's talking about this in two respects. I think he's talking about it Individually, but I think he's talking about it congregationally. Be single-minded. Be single-minded with who? Be single-minded with the one who gave you perfection and comfort. That makes sense. If Jesus gives me perfection and he gives me comfort, then my mind should be his mind. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2 and verse 5. So the idea of being single-minded with Jesus Congregationally, it works as well. Because if every single person is single-minded with Jesus, then we will be single-minded with each other. That's how it works. And therefore, be peaceful. Be peaceful. Well, now I'm not stressed. I'm not out of sorts. I'm not nervous. I'm not thinking about the terrors of hell. I can just dwell on the wonders of heaven. So this is intentional writing. When I become perfected in Jesus, I will find the comfort that I should have. And it will naturally make me single-minded with him, at which point I am at peace, Jesus said, I came to bring peace, not peace that the world gives, but the peace that I give. So see, this is intentional writing. Now, be this way, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, that makes sense because if I am perfected, I am being and am a perfected person, I can't help but have God with me because I'm with him. So this intentionality works. But now for the next few minutes, look at the phrase, greet one another with a holy kiss. The first thing I want you to notice is this. You cannot, we cannot do what is mentioned in verse 12 if we refuse to be what we're supposed to be in verse 11. It's not going to work. Number one, I won't want to. The world doesn't want to greet us with a holy kiss. It's not within their mindset. That has nothing with them. They don't have any connection with that at all. So if I'm not being this way, verse 11, then verse 12 isn't going to happen. More intentionality. I want to only if I'm already doing this. Number two, then I will be able to. 
Not only do I want to, but I'll be able to. If I'm not being this person, then how can I practice anything well that is called holy? Holiness toward others. But a third thing that I notice in this passage, verse 11 begins with me. He's concentrating on each individual. This is me. Be this way. My relationship with myself. But verse 12 is my relationship with my brethren. And that's what the point is. So therefore, don't you find it true that the way you are with yourself controls how you are with other people? If you don't like yourself at all, people have a terrible, terrible self-image. They're not people that you would call gregarious. They're not out there really giving themselves and enjoying the lives of others because they don't have a very good self-esteem anyway. So he begins saying, you need to be this way, and then you can do this other that I want you to do, which is greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, I need to figure out what that means. What is God telling me? Let's think about the word greet. Now, you and I think about the word greet, and we go, hey there, how you doing? So you're walking down the sidewalk, and somebody passes you, say, hi, and we've greeted them. No. We, we've greeted them in that we define it that way. We haven't greeted them. This word is a power-packed word that I'd never studied before. The word is espadzomai, and it means to bring to oneself. To bring to oneself. So, automatically you know when you're walking down the sidewalk and you say hi, you haven't done that. Because if you did that, you get shot. You're walking down the sidewalk, somebody passes, and you grab them and bring them to yourself. Whew. Lawsuit. That's just going to happen. So, obviously, he's not talking about us with the person we pass on the street. He's talking about us with us. The word osponsomai has a root word, spao, and it means to embrace with the arms. To embrace with the arms. Now, we had the visual demonstration of the cookie this morning. Okay, let's do a, a visual demonstration of spao, okay? Take your hands like this. I'm watching everybody's arms. Two your arms up, I'm not going any farther. Everybody, everybody has to. Not, not going to allow anybody to get out of this. Okay, now, come on, Felicity. Good job. Here you go. Embrace to yourself. Pull to yourself. That is spao. <laughs> Joe missed Helen, or Helen missed Joe. Well, I wasn't yet getting to that point. Yeah, we're, no, we're not on the kiss part yet. We're on the other part. Okay. We're not there yet. Okay. We'll, we'll get to there. I know y'all anxious, but we'll get there. Now, so, pull to yourself. Here's what's interesting. That word spao is the word that gives us our word spasm. Spasm. I thought, that doesn't make any sense. A muscle spasm is the same as greeting somebody? Hmm. So I started. In fact, I, I did just a little bit of work with it. And then I get this text from our resident athletic trainer, or I guess I would call him the uh, physiological person, you know, Mr. Ron Murray. And he writes me this little mini dissertation. And I said, this is wonderful because, number one, I don't have to share the blame if it's wrong, because he said the same thing. But number two, it deepened what I thought. This really is what's going on. And then he went to explain it. If you have an outline, I use some of his words. 
Uh, there are even some words in there, Titus, that you will like. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, I have the full writing. I'll send it to you. You'll appreciate the uh, semantics. So, here's what happened. He said, spasm. Spasm contracts the skeleton into itself. When a, when a muscle spasm happens, it draws up, right? You've done a lot of playing. I have too. Done a lot of coaching. Somebody has a cramp in the legs. What's the first thing you do? You try to grab it and pull it away from the direction it was trying to go. It's cramping the legs up this way, and you're pulling it out so that you can massage that cramp out, right? That's the natural reaction. It just draws it right in. Spasm. In a spiritual sense, then, spasm says we draw each other to ourselves. And the concept is to draw to the core. That's very personal. That's very connected. That's very intimate. To draw to the core. The part that I appreciated that Ron gave me that I hadn't thought about is that this spasm works even against active resistance. Try to hold your breath. And, and you hold it for as long as you can hold it. You have a competition. All right, let's see who can hold their breath the longest. Eventually, somebody's going to do what? Breathe. <sighs> Here we are trying not to, but because the body has to be aerated properly. You will breathe, and it's the spasm that causes it. Even, especially, in a pool in water, you know? If you try to hold your breath underwater, knowing that you can't act like water will help you breathing, that's how people drown. Can't help it. Spiritually speaking, if we are greeting as we should, then we can't help it. Because of who we are, be this way, God will be with you, we can't help it. We might actively try not to be this way. We might actively wish that we did not have to have or be a part of this family setting. But if you really are, perfected, comfortable, single-minded, peaceful. It will be like the person struggling to hold his breath. You can't do it. The spasm makes it happen. And if you are and we are children of God, naturally, we will just embrace to the core because that's who we are. You know, we can understand it even better this way. You're apart from your family. Maybe somebody's gone off to college. Maybe they've moved. Whatever. The minute you see them, after not having seen them for a while, what's that first reaction? Isn't it? Why? Because my family. Well, this is our family. It's not blood. In fact, it's thicker than that. So there ought to be this natural embrace and draw to the core. It ought to be as natural as breathing the oxygen and purifying the carbon dioxide away from us. That's what he's saying. 
That's what Paul is telling his brethren. You greet, you bring to the core. Of course, everybody wants to know, what's the holy kiss? I don't have a clue. I mean, the best I can do is to say, even now we see it in eastern countries or at least other countries from the U.S., don't we? They greet. Many times they will kiss each other on the cheek. My suspicion given where that part of the country is, that that's what's left over from this, what he's talking about. That part of the country, that's just what they did. Is God saying every time you see somebody, then you kiss them on each cheek? No, not saying that. I mean, one logical way of understanding that is this. If God really wanted us to kiss, he would have been very specific telling us how to do it. But since he didn't, then we're free to do what we do. You go to those countries and they want to do that, that's the kiss. Our country, you want a hug, that's the kiss. You want a handshake, that's the kiss. The point is, putting a spiritual and holy attitude on an intimate touch. That's what I think he's doing. I have to believe that when Jesus reached out and touched the leper, it was because of the touch. He didn't need to touch the leper, but the leper needed him to touch him. <coughs> Be clean. So the touch is important. So I think he is talking somewhat about touch. He's saying, be holy. It's not driven with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. It's driven by the holiness of life. So he's telling us as brethren, embrace and draw to the core of your being by reaching out to each of your brethren and being willing to make that a part of your life. And how do you do it? All kinds of ways. I just mentioned two or three in the outline. But any way that we can reach out and touch. Wasn't there a telephone commercial about that? Years ago, reach out and touch someone. That's the idea. In whatever ways we can reach out and touch, through fellowship, and in that crowded room in there, you can't help but touch. In fact, you have to move your chairs around to move, don't you? Or how about the other night, after we baptized that young man, and we stood out here and held hands in a circle, that's a touch that said something. Or when someone is needing help walking and we hold on to them, it's a touch. Or there's a child that needs consoling, it's a touch. There's something to that. Not sure that I've ferreted out all the details, but I think there's something there. So that's what he means, bring to the core through the holy kiss. And the word spasm really makes that concept, I think, come alive. Well, Jesus reached out and touched us. In fact, he's touched the whole world and they don't even know it. I think it's one of the greatest things ever. That every time an atheist writes a check, he's admitting the existence of God in Jesus. Because the date is based upon the birth of Jesus Christ. So see, he's touched us. He's changed the world like no other ever has. Maybe today he's touched you in a way that 
you're ready to make a change. Or maybe not make a change. Maybe as our sister Letha French did the other day, who said, I just want to say some good news that God has done for me. This time of a call doesn't have to be just someone in need and needing help. Could be someone who says, I've overcome and I want you to know about it and I appreciate it. But as we always do, let us stand and sing together and if you need us, will you come?